Well, we are uh, this morning in the fourth and final message, with the exception of Christmas Eve, in this series that we've called His Name Shall Be Called, based on Isaiah chapter 9, 1 through 7. And I'm going to ask you, in honor of God's Word, to stand again, and let's read again for the last time in this series, Isaiah 9, 1 through 7. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is God's word. You may be seated. Well, this fourth message, of course, brings us to that fourth name of this one who was promised, Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. In Hebrew, the name is Sar Shalom. Sar Shalom. And that that Hebrew title, Sar, which uh, in English is translated prince, means a ruler. Uh, one who exercises dominion. Viewing it historically, the, the Hebrew Tsar preceded the Roman title Caesar, Caesar, by centuries, if not millennia. But it means the same thing. And then Caesar moved, morphed into the Slavic word Tsar, um, C-Z-A-R, and its Russian form Tsar, T-Z-A-R, which we most often associate with the rulers of Imperial Russia and other Eastern European countries. Each of these words, um, Tsar, Caesar, Tsar, and Tsar, are similar in meaning. They come from the same linguistic root. So prince, and then peace, shalom, shalom. Hebrew greeting, uh, also in Arabic, salam. And it means peace, but it means so much more than the absence of conflict. It means wholeness. It speaks to health and vitality and security and tranquility, bliss, if you will. And as we look around our world today and as we look back through the centuries, the millennia of human history, we come to the realization that since the garden, the world has not known an abiding peace. We once experienced shalom. We once enjoyed the peaceful world and the peaceful life that we really wanted, the one that God wanted for us, the one that he conceived and he created for us. And in that perfect world... We lived in perfect peace, perfect shalom with our Creator. Peace within, peace with each other, peace with all of the rest of creation. But when sin entered the garden, when it entered the spiritual DNA of the human race, if you will, that pristine, primal, peace was shattered and destroyed. The disobedience of Adam resulted in shame and blame and alienation 
in our relationships with each other. It resulted in fear and evasion and alienation in our relationship with God. And it resulted in difficulty and disappointment and disorder in the natural environment and in our relationship with it. And you know, everything we hear about on the nightly news is contained therein. We once knew perfect peace. The problem of sin produced the loss of peace in every part of our existence, without exception. But into the tragedy of that moment so long ago, and into the brokenness of those relationships, God first spoke the promise of a Redeemer, the seed of the woman who would crush the head of the serpent, the embodiment of the deceiver, the evil one, Satan. And in the act of crushing the head of the serpent, would suffer greatly himself as well. That promised Redeemer is the one whom Isaiah points to as the wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. It is that Redeemer whom in chapter 7, verse 14, is given the name Emmanuel, God with us. And there's much that's confusing when we read the prophets. There's, there's so much that is uh, culturally appointed, if you will, cult- culturally oriented, things that we have a hard time understanding all these centuries later. But don't miss the quite simple and straightforward message that the prophet Isaiah is communicating to us who long for peace of mind, peace of heart, peace in our families, peace in our church, peace in our nation, peace in our world. He is saying fundamentally this, to us a child is born, he is the prince of peace, so if you desire peace, it is to him that you must go. To us a child is born, to us a son is given, he is the Prince of Peace. So if you desire peace, it is to him and him alone that you must go. Just a couple of days ago, I received an email from a friend who's also a pastor, and he mentioned that he had spent some time recently just combing through old Christian, or Christian, old Christmas messages from previous years. And being struck by how many of them were built around the twin twin themes of peace and hope. He went on to observe how very much those two are needed right now in our lives, perhaps more than ever. That in this time of pandemic, in this time of political distrust, social upheaval, when the foundations are being destroyed and passions are running hot and the future looks so uncertain. Peace and hope may, for many, be hard to find. To us a child is born, to us a son is given. He is the Prince of Peace, and if we desire peace, it is to him that each of us must go. Our next question of Isaiah, the prophet then, must be, well, who is this Prince of Peace? And the answer is right there in the text, that this Prince of Peace is, in fact, the promised Messiah, the son of David. Notice what he says in his very next words, verse 7 of chapter 9, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David, and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. In Sir Thomas Mallory's The Death of Arthur, the prominent contribution uh, to the expansive volumes of mythology surrounding the legend of King Arthur, uh, Mallory has these words engraved, in Latin, on Arthur's tombstone. Once and future 
king. Once and future king. And those familiar with the literature regarding King Arthur will know that the legend says that he will one day return and reign again over merry old England. Uh, this concept was hardly original with Sir Thomas Mallory, however, was it? That Mallory merely borrowed it from the Bible because the Bible reveals that it is David alone who rightfully bears that title once and future king. In one of his many interactions with the Pharisees, Jesus asked them, well, what do you think about the Christ, the Messiah? Whose son is he? Well, it wasn't exactly a hard question to answer because every Jewish child had known the answer from earliest memory. You probably could have heard some people in the back of the crowd saying, well, duh. And so they replied, the son of David, of course. Christ is the son of David. The Christ, the Messiah, would be a direct descendant of King David. Well, where did they get that information? One of the earliest places that that information is found is in 2 Samuel chapter 7, where it's recorded that the Lord sent the prophet Nathan to David with a promise. Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince, sar, over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may dwell in their own place, and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more, as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. A great name, a place, a house, an eternal throne. And armed with that knowledge, that David's house and kingdom will be in everlasting kingdom. And by the way, house speaks to his descendants. David's house, his lineage, and his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, that his throne would be established forever. Armed with that, we should not be at all surprised when we read in Luke chapter 1 the words of the angel Gabriel when he appeared to Mary, who would be the mother of of the Messiah. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob, that is Israel, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Nor should we be surprised at all to realize that Joseph, who was betrothed to Mary and would become the earthly father of Messiah, was himself a descendant of David, which is prominent in the gospel description 
of the nativity of Christ, which we find in Matthew and Luke. So that when Caesar Augustus decreed that everyone should return to their ancestral homes to be counted in the census, it was to Bethlehem, the city of David, that he and Mary, by that time in her late in her pregnancy, journeyed. It had been written 700 years earlier in the book of the prophet Micah, the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Nor should we be particularly surprised by the message of the angel in those nameless to those nameless shepherds outside Bethlehem, who said to them, Fear not, for behold, I, by the way, they're freaking out. He still says, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. The birthplace and the identity of the newborn is unmistakable. God gets uh, God gets the praise, and those who put their faith in this newborn Savior get the peace. Wow, you say. Miraculous, you say. Isaiah says, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Of course it's miraculous. Only God could accomplish it. The rule of this Prince of Peace will bring an end to war and it will bring as well increasing peace. So notice again, if you will, one more part of Isaiah's prophecy with me from verse 7 and then we'll move on. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Just two verses earlier, Isaiah's prophecy anticipates the accoutrements of war no longer being needed and therefore being destined for the fire. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. Earlier in chapter 2, Isaiah told us this about the reign of Messiah, that he shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Ain't going to study war no more. Ain't going to study war no more. Fast forward to the 25th chapter of Isaiah, verses 6 to 9, and the prophet gives us another glimpse of conditions in the coming kingdom of Christ. On this mountain, presumably Mount Zion, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations, which I take to be sin. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God, We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in our salvation. See, about all of this, the Bible has much to say, and we could be here all day on this final Sunday before Christmas exploring all of it. Of course, we won't. But if we were to do so, the sum of it all would still be this. 
To us a child is born. To us a son is given. He is the Prince of Peace. If we desire peace, it is to him that we must go. When this Prince of Peace comes, he comes not to take sides, but to take over. And in that place and in those lives where his rule and reign are realized, the result is peace, whether political or personal. The question at Christmas and throughout the year then is this. Will you? Will you go to him to find this peace that you so desire? You see, there there are really only two fundamental responses to the human predicament. They are framed for us, given voice by the work of two obscure British songwriters whose names were John Lennon and Paul McCartney. And the first response to this predicament of our sin is expressed in the immortal lyrics, we can work it out. We can work it out. Life is hard, the questions are complex, the answers the world provides are many and not satisfying. Large portions of Western society, indeed the entire world, have concluded that they can work it out on their own that they can find the answers to life by looking within. All of the answers are actually there, contained somewhere deep in your psyche, simply waiting to be discovered. So, so many people are looking for the light within and finding only darkness. It's not a new approach, actually. The, The writer of the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes pursued peace and contentment in all of the typical ways that most people do. In philosophy, the pursuit of wisdom. In work, the pursuit of personal accomplishment and significance. In pleasure, the pursuit of comfort. In drugs, the pursuit of who knows what. In sex, the pursuit of sensuality. And in materialism, the pursuit of stuff. And his starting point, as it is for all of us, because there is no other starting point for earthbound creatures, was everything under the sun. That is, everything that is available to us in the created world. And when you stand back from his writings, the writings of the writer of Ecclesiastes, and you consider his approach, you you will realize that he lived the American dream before there ever was one. And what he concluded and what he reported is that it is a dead-end street. Lennon and McCartney began their song, Try to See It My Way. Do I have to keep on talking till I can't go on? Maybe that's your lyric this morning. Maybe that's the lyric of your life. You've spent your life insisting on seeing things your way, and you've spent a great deal of time and a great deal of effort and perhaps even money trying to persuade yourself and those around you that you can work it out. And so let me ask you this morning, how's that working? How's that working out? And may I propose for your consideration the lyric that follows... Think of what you're saying. You can get it wrong, and still you think it's all right. You see, life is very short, and there's no time for fussing and fighting, my friend. Maybe it's time to stop the fussing and the fighting and shift your focus to the other response, which is expressed in the lyric, Help, I need somebody. Help, I need somebody. Not just anybody. You see, many others have concluded, having looked within and found only emptiness and found only darkness, that their need is something, is for something, or more precisely, someone outside of themselves. That their need is uh, for someone different from them, someone unlike anyone else. And as the years have gone on, they're finally willing to say, when I was younger, so much younger than today, I never needed anybody's help in any way. 
But now these days are gone. I'm not so self-assured. Now I find I've changed my mind and opened up the doors. Help me if you can. Help me if you can. Jesus said to his disciples, Peace I leave with you. Peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. So do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You might be saying, and I hope that perhaps you are, you've got my attention. I may be willing to open up the doors and acknowledge that I do need somebody, but how does that work? How does this Prince of Peace bring about an endless peace for us? How How would he bring that about for me? And I'm so glad that you asked that question. In these final moments, turn with me, if you have a Bible, to Colossians chapter 1, beginning at verse 19, and I want you to see three important words, and then I'll be done and we'll celebrate communion together before we depart. Colossians 1, beginning at verse 19. For in him, that is Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things. Notice the, the cosmic sweep of this reconciliation, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. The first word from this passage I'd like to bring to your attention is the word alienation. Alienation. Verse 21, And you once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. Alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. What's Paul saying? Let's begin with what he's not saying. He is not saying on this occasion that our evil deeds, our sinful actions, are the primary cause of our alienation from God. But rather, he is saying that they are the evidence of our alienation from God, even the proof of it. This alienation, he says, affects our minds, alienated and hostile in mind, It affects our mind, our believing, and so it shapes our lifestyle, our behaving. In short, the bad news of the Bible is that our lives are wrong because our minds are wrong. And our minds are wrong because of our human predicament, namely our alienation from God. Think of what you're saying. They wrote, you can get it wrong, and still you think that it's all right. We are each every good, uh, we're each very good at at rationalization, self-justification, aren't we? I mean, we can't think God's thoughts because our minds are alienated from Him. Our, Our thinking has become futile, and our spiritual hearts are darkened, and the outcome in our imperfect conduct is perfectly predictable. And that alienation seems to have a life of its own, doesn't it? It reaches out beyond us. It it pervades and it poisons our relationships with God and with others. Even those closest to us, our families and our friends. Bad news indeed. If we reject the Prince of Peace, what then? And the Bible tells us that the just compensation for our sin is death, both physical and spiritual, and that both unaddressed and unsolved are permanent and everlasting. So if we're wise, we will ask the question asked by Ebenezer Scrooge when the ghost of Christmas yet to come led him to view his own grave. Are these the shadow of things that will be, or are they shadows of things that might be? 
Is there any hope for change, for redemption, for transformation? Is there any good news? And the good news is that there is indeed good news. And it's found in our second important word, which is reconciliation. Reconciliation. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. See, the Bible teaches, and, and we, we understand in our experience, that sin erected a barrier between us and God. That barrier the Bible calls sin. And in response to that barrier, God in his mercy and his love and his grace has taken the initiative to do what you and I could never have done, to bring an end to our sin problem, to remove the barrier. The Bible says that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Well, how did he do that? How can God not count? How can a holy God, a righteous God, not count our trespasses against us? He did it by sending somebody. And not just anybody. He sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ. In the words of the Hallmark commercials, God cared enough to send the very best. And he sent his son to reconcile us to himself by shedding his own blood and dying in our place on the cross. In his death, Christ absorbed in his own body God's just wrath toward the sin of of all humanity, and he offered the once-for-all sacrifice for your sin and mine. Not only did Jesus, by his death, satisfy God's wrath forever, but he also removed our sins far from us. He took them away. And so Paul wrote in Romans chapter 5, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, before we could try to work it out, Christ died for us. And since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. What's the wrath of God? Is God just ticked off? No. No. The wrath of God is simply God's righteous response to the rebellion of the creation. It's a settled matter. The wage of sin is death. Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. God drawing us to himself, God solving the problem of the barrier that stood between us through his son, Jesus Christ. So just a few verses earlier in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Paul said, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, past tense, we have peace with God. Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, the third word is sanctification. Some of you are saying, get on with it, Jim. The third word is sanctification. And you won't find that word in this passage, but you will find it described because sanctification is what God does now in our lives from from the time that we trust in him. It's the transformative work of God by his Holy Spirit to make us the people he wants us to be. 
And so he says, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Well, what, what do those words mean, holy, blameless, and above reproach? It means this. It means that when you give up trying to work it out, when you give up trying to work out your own sin problem and you transfer your trust from your efforts to Christ's accomplishment at the cross, not only does God forgive your sins entirely and permanently and reconcile you to himself, but then he makes you his own. And that's what's tied up in that word holy. He sets you apart. You're now his. Your identity, your citizenship changes. You become his very own. You're adopted into his family. And then he cleanses you of every stain that sin has left on your soul. And that's what's tied up in that word blameless. There's no mark left on your soul of sin from the perspective of God. So that no accusation can ever again be brought against you that would stick and lead to your condemnation. And that's what's tied up in that phrase above reproach. Holy, blameless, and above reproach before him. Well, how is that even possible? It's it's possible only because of the immensity of God's love for you and the fact that long before you ever cried out, help, I need somebody, he sent his only son, his one and only son, Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. In his short letter, Jude, whom we presume to be the brother of Jesus, and staying with the theme, you might just say, hey, Jude. Jude 1, verse 24, Jude refers to Jesus as him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. And maybe you've wondered and you've imagined that day when you'll stand before God. I certainly have. And and it's a fearful thing. And you say, how can I stand in my sin before a righteous and holy God? And the answer is the sanctifying, the reconciliation that God accomplished through Christ and the sanctification that he's working in you by his Holy Spirit. So that if you're in Christ, he will one day present you blameless and with great joy before his very presence. See, Jesus truly is the Prince of Peace. His gifts bring peace with God, peace of mind peace of conscience, peace with yourself, peace in our relationships, and one day peace and abiding permanent peace when he comes to reign in our world. And this is what we celebrate at Christmas. And this is the good news. Great good tidings of great joy, which shall be for all the people. For unto you is born a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, I pray today for those who are standing on the edge of faith, on the at the one-yard line, about to cross the line. And Lord, I pray that today might be the day that you would grant them the gift of faith that leads to life. And Lord, that you would enable them to trust in this Prince of Peace, this Jesus, your Son, eternal God, whom you sent into our world in human flesh to solve the problem of our separation from you. Lord, may this Christmas be the time that they look back on in the future and say that was the, that was the day, that was the week, that was the moment that I progressed from my separation and the predicament of my sin into peace and holiness 
and blamelessness and joy. Amen.